Good afternoon. This is Tim Fry, a partner with the healthcare group at McGuire Woods, and thank you for joining us today on this webinar with respect to the Federal Trade Commission's recent final rule on non-competes. Um, and we've called this a primer for healthcare leaders. So everyone that is on this phone, you are a leader in the industry and we appreciate you joining us. Um, and we hope to uh, share a little bit of background about the rule, some of the nuances for the healthcare space, as well as some of the legal challenges and some of the kind of practical tips on how you might want to handle it. I'm joined by a great group of colleagues today, both from the healthcare group and from labor and employment. Um, their names and contact information is on the screen, and we'll, of course, come back to it at the end. It's a full house on purpose. We have quite the team at the firm working on this rule analyzing it, understanding it for a number of different scenarios, and intentionally doing so, so that you can reach out to your typical McGuire Woods contacts, because we know this will impact so many of you. One thing that I'm going to add is we are applying for CLE credit. As I'm not sure all the rules, I'm going to give an opening code, and my colleague Kayla Marty will give a closing code later in the presentation. Please write these down. It's not clear to me that you actually need these codes. I think it depends on the state. Um, but in the follow-up e-comms, if you're applying for CLE credit um, and we are able to get that approved, you'll need these codes potentially. So for the opening code today, I'm a very creative thinker, and we're going to use healthcare as the opening code, use that as one word, health care. Before I turn it over to some of my great colleagues to share thoughts on the rule, the rulemaking timeline, et cetera, I just want to share a disclaimer. We are going to speak to what the rule talks about. And candidly, some of those conversations will likely just say, the rule says X. Um, to save ourselves the trouble of constantly chiming in and saying the FTC believes the rule says X or the FTC's position, just understand everything we say today should not be taken as an endorsement of the FTC's view. And we certainly reserve the right, including for some on this call, to challenge the rule, take different positions, and draft non-competes in the future, um, notwithstanding any either text or oral statement on the rule. Hopefully that's appreciated and understood. Um, if, you, if you want to hold us to it, um, please drop off the phone. Um, this is really intended for healthcare leaders to try to explain the rule and what they might face. So with that, let me turn it over to my colleague, Danny Bush, who helped uh, put so much of this together, who's going to share a little bit about the timeline and high level of the rule before we turn it over to Mike Phillips, um, a partner in our labor and employment group, to share some of the high level thoughts before we get into industry specific things. Danny? Thanks, Tim, and a uh, warm welcome to everybody who's attending today. So uh, we found um, that this FTC rulemaking process was much akin to a thriller novel uh, in, in, in so much that there was um, some, some foreshadowing uh, before the actual final rule came out. Um, in fact, it started pretty much as soon as the Biden administration took over um, and, uh, and Biden um, ordered or, or, or executed a non, or sorry, an, an executive order on non-competes um, just a few months after he took over the presidency. In the intermittent space between then and uh, what was eventually the proposed rule, the FTC made a series of negative statements on non-competes generally, again, foreshadowing their ultimate intent to regulate and, and of course, ban these. Um, and it was a series of one-two punches uh, on January 4th and January 5th of last year that the FTC started taking legal action, uh, specifically in three cases on non-competes, based on their Section 5 of the FTC Act to, uh, to 
um, prevent unfair methods of competition. Um, and then the, the, the next day uh, issued a, a notice of proposed rulemaking and, and public comment. Um, and several hundred, and I think up to thousands of comments later, uh, the FTC approved. Um, on party lines, they issued the final rule uh, by a three to two vote. So narrowly, narrowly went through. Um, and that was on April 23rd of this year. Uh, the rule was published in the Federal Register on May 4th, and so the effective date would be then September 4th, um, upcoming in just a few minutes. We'll be here sooner than we all realize. So that's the date to look forward to. <clears throat> now, um, the FTC in their final rule, and, uh, and as well is in this um, handy graphic that we've attached, uh, cited to a number of facts, some statistics um, that sort of was their reasoning behind banning non-competes. Um, for example, that nearly one in five people are under a non-compete in some form or another, um, and that by banning them, they could increase new business formation, increase wages, um, and even uh, increase the number of patents issued. Uh, so it's sort of some of the reasoning behind it, but, um, but generally speaking, uh, um, you know, they, they had a number of facts, a number of considerations from different industries and, and reasons that, that they did this. But overall, what we're looking at, is, as Mike will begin to explain in a moment, is a, is a general ban. Um, that it's unfair method of competition for any person to enter a non-compete clause or to enforce any existing non-compete clauses, um, except for very limited exceptions, most of which will end uh, on the effective date, which again is September 4th. Mike, I'll pass it to you to, to give us an overview of the role. Thanks very much, Danny, and uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I'm going to show you some of the key definitions under the rule. Um, a person is any natural person, partnership, corporation, association, or other legal entity within the FTT, FTC's jurisdiction, including any person acting under color or authority of state law. A worker uh, is all current and former employees, independent contractors, extras, interns, volunteers, apprentices, or sole proprietors, and that includes uh, owners and physician partners. And a non compete is any term or condition of employment that either prohibits a worker from, and why the worker for, or functions to prevent a worker from seeking or accepting work with a different employer or operating a new business each after the conclusion of the worker's employment. So uh, if these seem like broad definitions, uh, they are, and they're intended to be. Uh, as Danny mentioned, what this rule is aiming to do uh, is create a very broad, comprehensive ban on non-compete clauses in the United States. Okay. So, uh, you know, we've received some questions about, uh, you know, what about a non-compete in an operating agreement, what about a non-compete in equity grant agreement? Any uh, non-compete that pertains to a worker, uh, as is defined here, and that uh, is a non-compete as described uh, in the FTC rule, is going to be within the scope. So the answer to most of these questions uh, is yes. Uh, your non-compete is covered by the rule and will be banned by the rule. There's only four exceptions, maybe three and a half, uh, generally recognized. Uh, we'll talk about a few of them in detail. One is sale of a business. Uh, one is a franchise agreement, which is specifically exempted. One is there's a limited uh, exemption for senior executive non-competes. We're going to talk about that for a minute. And then, then uh, the other categories, business-to-business -business agreements, are not specifically uh, prohibited. However, uh, as you may know, non-competes in those agreements can be problematic under antitrust laws. So I wouldn't go so far as to say uh, that they have a green light. Um, but uh, I would say three and a half exemptions to the rule, uh, and that's really about it. So what about... Uh, the non-compete that your employees already have, uh, does the rule affect those? And the answer is yes, it does. Not only does it 
expand those existing non-competes, with one exception that we'll address in a minute, but you have to tell your workers uh, that their non-competes are no longer enforceable, and we'll tell you specifically how to do that in just a moment. I want to first, though, address this uh, narrow uh, exemption for senior executives. Uh, senior executives who have an existing non-compete, one that's entered into before the September 4th uh, effective date of the rule, those agreements can remain in effect uh, subject to existing limitations uh, that exist under the law. Uh, but a uh, senior executive is, again, narrowly defined. Do you see the definition here? Uh, the question is, will this apply to my vice president of human resources? Will this apply to the uh, president of the division? Uh, will this apply to somebody who runs uh, a, a medical office or a dental office? Almost certainly not. Um, what this definition is intended to cover is true what we might call C-suite people, people at a very high level uh, who are in a policy-making position uh, and uh, exceed the 151,164 um, threshold that you see there. Now, you know, this is all, of course, subject to uh, litigation interpretation of the rule, uh, but the FTC's interpretation is that the uh, non-compete exception for senior executives is very narrow. And, Mike, just as you're going to the next slide, that yeah. policy-making word, um, if I could just ask, you know, from a labor and employment perspective, is that a kind of standard term that you're totally familiar with? Or is this, to your point on, you know, being litigated, is this kind of something new the FTC's kind of ginned up? It's not, it's not totally new. It's not uh, completely out of the blue. There is There are some uh, statutes that talk about uh, policymaking position. It's not, though, I would say, a well-defined term uh, where everybody understands what it means. There's a lot of gray area uh, in that term. Uh, I think it's been construed a, a, a little bit broader in other contexts than what the uh, FTC is uh, presenting it as including. So that, and that, may, that, that kind of gets back to my comment that this may be the subject of some uh, litigation interpretation as to what that term means. All right, we're showing you here uh, how you give notice to your employees. And basically, there's two ways of doing it. One is uh, everybody who has an existing non-compete, uh, you send them a uh, notice. It can be by email. It can be by regular mail, um, but in a way that's calculated to provide them with notice, uh, essentially that um, their uh, non-compete is no longer valid because of the FTC rule. Uh, and the only real exception to that is if, if somebody that you don't have any contact information for uh, whatsoever, a former, a former worker, uh, for instance, that you've just lost touch with. Uh, but if you have their contact information, you need to notify them. So that's one method. Uh, the second method is to provide all of your workers, all of your current workers, even those without a non-compete clause, so everybody, with a notice that looks like this notice uh, on the left-hand side of the screen here. Uh, so if you're going to follow the second method, uh, we would strongly advise that you take this notice uh, and uh, deliver it verbatim. Uh, in other words, uh, it's not clear that uh, the FTC is going to allow you to rephrase it or put it in your own words. Um, if you're going to use the second method uh, of notifying all your current workers, um, we, we would suggest you use the form notice. All right, one piece of good news, uh, somewhat good news. Uh, what about my non-solicitation provisions, my confidentiality agreements, my non-disclosure agreements? Uh, are those banned by the rule? Not necessarily. Um, the uh, FTC rule um, doesn't say that those are lawful and enforceable, um, but it also says that they're permissible um, unless um, they function to prevent workers from obtaining employment or starting their own businesses. So what that means, or what we think it means, at least at this point, 
is that they can't be so broad that they effectively function as an ad compete, that they effectively prevent somebody uh, from leaving uh, employment uh, and going to a competing business. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, you know what you need to do in light of this rule, but one thing we've been suggesting to clients is that they take a look at uh, those non-solicitation provisions, those confidentiality provisions, and in some cases, you might want to narrow those. Uh, you might want to make sure they're very specific and tailored uh, so that they will be enforceable if this rule goes into effect and they won't fall into the trap of the FTC rule uh, as a non-compete uh, will. Um, and if you don't do that, uh, the risk is uh, that the FTC will consider them to be a non-compete or a court enforcing this rule will consider them to be a non-compete uh, and they will be uh, ruled to be unenforceable, and possibly there's some civil penalties that uh, will apply. Uh, so that's the basic uh, outline of the rule. I'm going to pass the baton to Kristen, who's going to talk about some healthcare specific aspects of the new rule. Thank you. So the FTC received over 26,000 comments to its proposed rule, and those of us in the McGuire Woods Healthcare Department, as we talked to clients and tracked the comments, we could see that many of these were focused on healthcare. One study that cited on this slide analyzed the public comments, and based on the samples they reviewed, the study concluded that the, the vast majority, 70% of the comments were healthcare industry focused. And this makes sense. Healthcare has a broad customer base. It's seen a ton of investment and it comprises a sizable portion of GDP. And the healthcare industry certainly employs a lot of workers, many of whom may be subject to non compete. The final rule cites the comments reporting that 68% of cardiologists and 72% of American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons are subject to non compete. And based on my experience doing healthcare transactions and drafting employment agreements, this sounds about right, depending on how many of these physicians are in California or a state that already restricts non compete. The um, comments urge the FTC, many of the comments urge the FTC to exclude the healthcare industry or address it separately. Um, the commission firmly declined to adopt an exception for healthcare, stating that it was not persuaded that the healthcare industry is uniquely situated in a way that would justify special treatment. Instead, the rule cites two findings that non competes increase healthcare costs. So, as finalized, the prohibition applies to all persons as it's defined broadly with no special exceptions or carve outs for medical practices, private equity, hospitals, any healthcare industry player. The FTC does recognize somewhat reluctantly that not all entities in the healthcare industry fall under its jurisdiction, and this would include certain nonprofits. There were a lot of comments in the healthcare industry stating that the market would be distorted in favor of tax exempt and nonprofit health systems and others that would not be subject to this rule, um, but that did not persuade the FTC to carve out health care. And I will let Kayla um, follow up on that point on the nonprofit health systems and the FTC jurisdictional authority there. Hey. Thanks, Kristen. So I know that many of you are on the phone are for nonprofit health systems, so I'll get into this in just a moment. But before I do, I just wanted to make two public service announcements. One is if you do need codes for CLE, the second code for our presentation is FTC. Again, very unoriginal. Um, and then number two, if you do have questions about these topics, there is a Q&A box on the system that you should be able to input your questions. We will start to try to answer those questions as we go along as well as during the Q&A period. If any of your questions are very specific to your organization, please still feel free to put them into the question box. We will follow up with you separately afterwards to get into any of those details. And as always, like Tim mentioned at the beginning, please feel free to reach out if you do have questions and we can address those questions specifically or point you to the right person. 
So with that, I'm going to talk a little bit more about nonprofit hospitals and health system entities. I think most people on the phone are very interested in this exception. You have probably heard through thought leadership, maybe even your local news channel, that quote unquote, nonprofit hospitals are not subject to this law. And what that's rooted in and what people are talking about when they say that is the FTC, as Kristen mentioned, reluctantly acknowledged that there are certain entities that don't fall within the purview of this law because they don't actually fall under the FTC's jurisdiction under the FTC Act. And so uh, the reason why you hear that nonprofit entities may not fall under the law is because the FTC Act specifically authorized the FTC to regulate corporations, which is defined on the slide as an entity organized to carry on business for its own profit or for that of its members. And for some nonprofit and tax exempt hospitals and other healthcare entities, they may not fall within the definition of a corporation. And so therefore this particular rule may not apply to them. That does not mean, however, that the FTC is taking the position that all nonprofit and tax exempt entities are exempt from the rule and exempt from their uh, jurisdiction. You'll see here, as we've included on the slide, there's a very specific quote uh, in, the, in the guidance that the FTC released that said that there's roughly 58% of hospitals that claim tax exempt status as nonprofit, and they believe some portion of those are likely to fall within the jurisdiction. And the reason they believe that is because they would be considered a corporation even if they are claiming nonprofit or tax exempt status. Uh, this is not a completely novel argument by the FTC. If you'll see on this slide, we've included two examples in which the FTC has exercised jurisdiction over nonprofit or tax exempt entities. One was a physician hospital organization that uh, they asserted was engaged in business on behalf of for-profit physician members, and therefore they had jurisdiction over. The other in this uh, slide is an independent physician association that was claiming tax exempt status because it was organized uh, with the benefit of its for-profit members. So you'll see that we do have some precedent for this uh, claim by the FTC. We do believe it will be significantly litigated. Uh, we also believe this is one of the most uncertain parts of the rule right now, just because uh, there is some, some gray area here. So I'm going to dig just a little deeper into what Mike was talking about earlier with respect to specific clinical workers. So as Mike recapped, you will be set or your organization is subject to the final rule as the FTC has currently written it if you have non-competes with quote-unquote workers. And that terminology of worker was intentional by the FTC. They did not intend for it to be just owners or just employees or just paid employees or W-2 versus 1099. They really did intend for the definition to be extremely expansive. And so what that means for healthcare entities is your physician owners could qualify, your physician employees could qualify, your other clinical employees, such as your MAs, physical therapists, if you have them, nurses, any independent contractors, pathologists, anesthesiologists, those are all people that could qualify even if they're not technically employees of your organization. So we are expecting that the term worker is going to continue to be expanded on in the court cases that are currently outstanding and which will be talked about here in a little bit. But specifically, we expect the term providing services to an organization to be really looked at critically because there's some unique types of arrangements that exist in the healthcare space, such as uh, ambulatory surgery centers imaging facilities and other organizations that have touch points with physicians that are not squarely employee uh, employer relationships and aren't always scenarios in which the physicians are 
uh, acting on behalf of that organization as employees or providing services. So look out for that. We do think there's going to be some more guidance uh, that comes out from various case laws, assuming the law ultimately stands. The other question that we've been getting from clients very frequently is there must be an exception for highly compensated individuals. And, and there is to an extent, but not only on the basis of the person being highly compensated. So as Mike mentioned earlier, there is an exception to the rule for quote unquote senior executives. And this rule does not extend, and this exception does not extend past the effective date of September 4th of 2024, there is not allowed to be under the rule any new non-competes after that date. But for periods uh, when non-competes existed prior to September 4th, 2024, there is a very limited exception that also applies uh, to highly compensated physicians if they meet the senior executive two-part test. And that bit if is very important. So the two-part test, as Mike reviewed earlier, is the individual physician or executive in the healthcare space has to make more than this $151,000 number that's listed on the slide, and they must be in a policy-making position. And Mike fleshed out earlier what it meant to be in a policy-making position, but this is a particularly difficult concept within the healthcare industry because we often have many individuals, large boards of physicians, and so we're really going to be looking out for that deep dive definition of policy-making decision as things evolve if the law does stand after various litigation challenges. So one of the issues that's very probably simple and is likely to be accepted by the FCC is your CEO. So if you have a CEO of an organization, that person is a physician or a non-physician, and the person exceeds the, the executive compensation threshold that's here on the slide, it's very likely that that person is going to be acceptable to be a senior executive. But there is a lot of gray area that's going to exist. There's going to be gray area for physician board members. There's going to be gray area of physician executives that are not in day-to-day -day policy decision-making over major components of the organization. Like Tim gave the example earlier with respect to human resources or marketing alone, that's a specific example that is in the statute that we need to all, or in the guidance document, which we all need to be aware of and looking at closely. But a lot of this is going to continue to evolve. We just want you to be aware that it exists today uh, based on what has been publicly released by the FTC. And notably, the FTC does anticipate that this exception is going to be extremely narrow and only apply to very few workers. A lot of questions we have also already seen with respect to moonlighting. This is not covered by the current FTC rule. The FTC rule does permit restriction with, with respect to exclusivity, outside activities, and non-competition restrictions while you are employed. Each of the components that we've talked about today are intended to be once you are no longer employed or once you are no longer considered a worker. But during the term of being a worker with the organization, there can be these outside activity restrictions, which I know many of you have in your agreements, which are very important for both a compliance perspective and for uh, protecting the ability for the individual to work for you during the time of uh, employment. So just as a asterisk there, that is not uh, being eroded at this time. So next, uh, my colleague Danny is going to talk a little bit about state law preemption. Thanks, Kayla. So as many of you are probably aware, especially those of you who are leaders in multi-jurisdictional businesses, um, the states in the United States can have quite the varying attitude and, uh, and um, stance on non-competes. For example, in California, they tend to be more strict. In other states, they tend to be more permissive. And further still, some states such as Texas uh, have interesting um, requirements for non-competes, such as that uh, they have to have buyout clauses. So what about those states? Well, FTC, their position at the very least is that they preempt, or, or the final rule rather, preempts state laws governing non-competes. So if you are currently in compliance with a state law, 
um, with your employees who are working in that state, you may not be in compliance with FTC's final rule. Their position is that the final rule supersedes state laws that, quote, permit or authorize a person to engage in conduct that is an unfair method of competition. So in other words, those very same non-competes that they've talked about banning. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, states have to confine, constrain their legislation to do exactly what FTC um, has uh, regulated for in the final rule. Um, in fact, the final rule preserves the state authority with respect to these other restricted covenants um, non-solicitations, et cetera, as long as they don't authorize non-competes in contradiction with the final rule or that are more permissive than the final rule. So getting back to the question about Texas, in, uh, in Texas where a buyout clause is a requirement, that's probably still going to be valid as long as the employer sought to enforce existing non-competes against a physician who's also qualified as a senior executive, for example. Um, we also have in Indiana a ban on primary care physician non-competes. That's probably going to continue for senior executives. One other question you might have about non-competes with respect to your employees is uh, those that are currently in tail periods. So after their employment agreement has ended, they've terminated their employment. They have, uh, you know, what we see is one to five years of a tail period wherein they have been pr uh, prohibited from uh, competing. And uh, FCC, again, has made this rather clear. They define worker as a natural person who works or previously worked. So clear uh, intent to ban non-competes with respect to not only current employees, but also employees who are now in tail periods and who may be in tail periods once the approval takes effect. Um, FCC also notes that Formal workers subject to a non-compete must also receive the notice that Mike went into detail. So when you're thinking about making, taking notice, giving notice to your employees, you'll also need to think about giving notice to employees who are currently in tail periods, unless, for example, you don't have any information about where they live or something like that, um, or unless an exception applies, which, uh, as we've discussed, uh, those won't be applying for long, many of them. So there is, there is an exception there, but you should plan on in terms of um, as you prepare to take action uh, to include those and, and think about those uh, employees, including maybe taking an inventory or a roster of them um, who are currently in tail periods. Finally, a quick note that uh, any existing litigation going on about non-competes, um, personal litigation, uh, that litigation can continue, and we even anticipate uh, the FTC's final rule being cited in such arguments. Now, I'll pass it to Kristen for what you've probably all been waiting for, which is the bona fide uh, sale or business exception. Kristen? Thanks, Danny. Yeah, indeed. A key exception in the rule applies to bona fide sales of businesses. Specifically, the exception states that the rule does not apply to a non-compete clause that's entered into by a person pursuant to a bona fide sale of a business entity of the person's ownership interest in a business entity or of all or substantially all of the business entity's operating assets. And this is a win, at least a partial win for investors. First, the good news is the final rule does not limit the exception only to substantial owners, members, or partners which you may recall is defined in the proposed rule as an owner, member, or partner with at least a 25% ownership interest in the business entity being sold. There were a lot of comments on this proposal. Most of the commenters who supported the exception asserted that the 25% threshold was too high and does not account for the reality of most transactions in which owners with less than 25% may have significant goodwill and and receive significant transaction proceeds. Um, definitely this is the case in physician practice transactions and we saw some comments on this point. The FTC considered instead conditioning the exception on the value of the transaction proceeds or adopting the totality of the circumstances or some type of reasonableness test. Um, they also considered and agreed with commenters that parties may abuse the exception with the 25% through setting up subsidiaries and engaging in what they viewed as sham transactions. Um, ultimately, though, the FTC added the term bona fide 
and they made changes clarifying that any accepted non-compete in the sale of business must be made in good faith rather than to circumvent the prohibition. In general, based on the preamble, the FTC considers a bona fide sale to be one that's made between two independent parties at arm's length and in which the seller has a reasonable opportunity to negotiate the terms of the sale. And so that does offer protection in a lot of, of transactions. Um, when and if the rule goes into effect, we will need to really consider the what this bona fide sale does and does not encompass um, and how it will apply in transactions. And we're having these discussions now. Um, FTC stated that the use of what it described as so-called springing non-competes arising out of repurchase rights or mandatory stock redemption programs are not entered into pursuant to bona fide sales because in each case, the worker had no goodwill they were selling for the non-compete or knowledge or ability to negotiate the terms or conditions of the sale at the time of contracting. And, you know, participating in healthcare transactions or other transactions, um, you know, there's not always every seller at the table. And so that's going to be a consideration, you know, what are the terms of the sale with respect to each and every one of these sellers and who's bound by a non-compete and who's not. Um, and then the springing, the springing um, transactions are going to come into place outside of, you know, strict purchase and sale agreements, looking at rollover equity agreements, retention bonuses. Well, we'll have to go through the whole suite and kind of pressure test, you know, where we're losing some of the non-compete protections and where we'll need to supplement and other areas or restructure or revalue. Um, I will move now to the next slide, which is... Um, addressing a question we've gotten a lot, um, asking, does the final rule restrict business to business non-competes? And the short answer here is no. Um, but business to business non-competes that attempt to prohibit individual workers from competing post-term are not allowed. So for example, a medical director coverage, other group practice agreement between two businesses could include a non-compete but that non-compete could not apply directly to individual physician workers, even those providing the coverage or medical direction under the agreement in a way that would restrict them from changing jobs, working for another medical practice, or starting their own. Um, keep in mind, as Danny stated earlier, other state laws and laws will apply in this context. And now I will turn it over to Tim to talk about what others are saying. Well, we'll start to close this out, and I think hopefully in those last few slides you saw all the different things um, with our colleagues speaking in terms of how this is going to impact our industry, right? So business to business, so many um, systems uh, that hire groups to manage service lines, well, the, the group and then each physician will enter into non-competes, um, surgery centers, dialysis facilities. All of those things are going to have to be reconsidered um, if and when this rule takes effect. So let's get to the if this rule takes effect with some of what others are saying. And, and we have three quotes here on the screen that you can read. You do not need me to read it of those that have called things unlawful, a power grab. The only saving grace is it'll be short-lived, um, increase of costs, limits of innovation. But there are others in our industry, assuming I can get animation to work, I uh, did, thankfully, um, like uh, those representing physicians and nurses that are were very favorable to this rule. Indeed, when Kristen was sharing some about how the healthcare industry was the number one industry in, in not, by orders of magnitude, more than any other industry on commenting on this rule, the vast, vast majority of comments were in favor of the FTC adopting this rule. Um, again, usually physicians 
um, nurses, dentists, vets, uh, veterinarians, nurse practitioners, et cetera, um, were very favorably inclined. And so you see that as well as what people are saying here based on this rule. And so you sort of see this dichotomy a little bit of organizations and workers having very different views about the need for non-competes, the use of non-competes. And that isn't just coming in trade associations. Mike, um, can you take it away on some of the current challenges to the non-compete rule and maybe what we see is, you know, very high level, what, what we might expect to see this summer? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so it has become almost the norm when uh, there's a new government regulation uh, is that there are legal challenges uh, to the regulation. Uh, there's three such challenges pending. There's really now two because two of these cases have been consolidated into one. Uh, but it's the, uh, the Ryan and Chamber of Commerce case, which is pending in Texas, and a case called ATS Tree Service, uh, which is pending in Pennsylvania. The uh, Texas cases are in a little bit of a faster track. Um, there's a decision on a preliminary injunction uh, expect by July 3rd in the ATS case. The same kind of injunction has been requested, but the court uh, has said it will have a ruling by July 23rd. Uh, by the end of July, we should know a lot more about if these challenges are going to be successful. And what they're trying to do uh, primarily is obtain a stay of the rule, uh, have a court say that the rule either exceeds uh, the FTC's authority um, or that it's unconstitutional in some way uh, and get a uh, court stand so it doesn't go into effect in September uh, and it won't go into effect until there's a ruling by a higher court and maybe even by uh, the Supreme Court. Now, one thing we don't know, though, uh, is that uh, is one, whether these litigants will be successful, but two, what the scope of an injunction will be. Uh, and without getting too into the issue, there's been a, a lot of pushback against, a, you know, a single court somewhere in Texas or Pennsylvania or elsewhere uh, uh, imposing an injunction that applies to the whole country or broad groups of people. So what we might see is, uh, you know, yes, there's an injunction and a stay, but it applies only to members of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Or uh, if the ATS challenge is um, successful, uh, there might be one tree service in Percasey, Pennsylvania, uh, that doesn't have to comply with the rule, but everyone else is on their own. Uh, so there's a lot of unknowns uh, at this point. Uh, we, we should know a lot more. Uh, by the end of July, where this is all going uh, from the litigation point of view. Thanks, Mike. And you heard, I think, all day from us a little bit of if the rule takes effect. I think a lot of commenters uh, think it's highly likely there is some pauses, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't start to prepare. Um, we're about four months away from the effective date, September 4th. Um, that gives you some time to plan, be strategic, and, and start to prepare. And and I think, you know, as I kind of, we wrap up and MC and start to head to questions, you know, I, I think it's helpful, and I know we got some questions in the chat boxes of what should we do? Um, we're negotiating new agreements, we're buying businesses, you know, if this was to take effect in four months, we might lose the non-compete. Does that mean we delete it now? And, and maybe, Mike, I'll turn it back to you, um, and then others on this call may want to share a few others. Can you give folks some practical, you know, concrete things that they should be thinking about and doing today? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, things we've been telling our clients just in general, and obviously specific advice is going to depend on your specific Agreement, but in general, uh, what we've been telling clients: don't panic, at least not yet. Um, don't delete uh, your non-compete provisions from your agreements, even from new agreements, uh, and don't give notice to anybody yet that their non-competes are not effective. But uh, a couple things you should be doing: one, uh, 
severability. It's a very, uh, I guess, arcane uh, legal term, and it only matters until it matters. But what it means is that you want to make sure that your agreement says, if this non-compete is ruled to be unenforceable, it doesn't affect anything else in the agreement. And most uh, agreements have that in some form. Some don't. Uh, that's one thing we want to make sure of. The other thing that I mentioned earlier is look at your other clauses, not your non-compete, but your non-solicit, your non-disclosure, your confidentiality, uh, and make sure that they're narrowly tailored, written in a way that's likely to be enforceable, um, because you want to use those as a backstop. You want to be able to say, even if this rule takes effect, and my non-compete's unenforceable, I've still got tools that I can use to prevent somebody from unfairly competing against my business. So uh, those are the two major things we're telling clients to do uh, right now, uh, and obviously we'll have some further advice uh, after we learn more about the legal challenges. Thanks, Mike. I think that's so helpful. I think, you know, if you haven't cataloged who you have restrictive covenants with within your organization before now might be a good time and in and, and you know do some serious soul searching on did we truly need it or did we just put it in all our forms um, one thing that um, I think we're all very cognizant of and I think Danny mentioned it earlier is even if this rule is stayed if it's pause kept from you know taking effect in September the FTC has now spoken very forcefully against non-competes and you can certainly believe those challenging non-competes will fight that and in, in many states the trend has been to restrict use of non-competes both in healthcare and further than healthcare. I think that's going to continue in the case law. So, you know, I think to Mike's point of looking at your non solicits, your trade secrets, et cetera, and, and seeing if they're strong and narrow, you know, you may want to do that for your non competes as well, even if you think this rule won't take effect. Um, the states and those challenging non competes may very well kind of get on the same thing. And then one other thing I'll just add that we've been talking to folks about on the healthcare team, and it came up, and I heard it said probably better than I had ever heard it said a couple weeks ago at our healthcare private equity event in Chicago. One of the panelists said, we recruit our physicians every day. We don't just rely on a non-compete. We are constantly considering, are we paying market rates? Are we making sure our coffee tastes good? Are we getting the support staff? Are we trying to keep things from happening? We want to be a fantastic employer for our physicians and other staff. We want them culturally to like us. You know, if all you've done historically is rely on non-competes to kind of lock in physicians, now might be a good time to reconsider that. Do you want to go down that pathway, which we're hearing some do, of that idea of recruiting physicians every day, recruiting nurse practitioners every day, uh, other staff every day? Um, that's something that the FTC would like you to do, and, and it might be give you some good business opportunities as well. So just put that on your radar screen as well. We have additional resources from the firm, including a frequently asked, frequently asked questions guide. And if you thought we had a full house today on the webinar, um, we probably tripled that in terms of those that were involved in helping us draft those FAQs for healthcare leaders. Um, and then we also have kind of the general alert. So we welcome you um, when you receive the PowerPoint uh, after this you know, probably after the Memorial Day weekend, our staff will send it out. Please click those links, find them on our website. If you want it before then, feel free to send me or anyone else that was on today's webinar um, 
a note. Um, you have our contact information. We're going to go into question mode in just a second, um, but you know, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, I don't know why uh, we still use fax uh, numbers and things like this. We probably should put our LinkedIn links instead. Maybe we'll fix that in a future webinar, but if you want to fax me a question here, please feel free, um, or use the Q&A box as part of the um, system, um, and we'd welcome some questions for the last uh, about 10 minutes. In, as I wait for some new questions to come in, some that I think we've tried to answer throughout, Mike, I'd love to go back to you. What about, we, we heard about things like springy non-competes as those that um, the FTC was trying to restrict. What about something like gardening leave? Can you agree to kind of pay someone to kind of not compete towards the end of their employment. Um, did the FTC speak to that um, from your knowledge? Yes, I, I, I think so. Um, and I think that, that a garden leave arrangement uh, is something that uh, would be a way uh, to have a, in essence, a post-employment uh, non-compete. So for those of you not familiar with garden leave, which I believe is actually a British term, uh, it's where uh, someone's active employment will end, but they continue to be compensated for a period of time uh, during the course of their uh, non-compete. Um, and, and the reason I think that it would be uh, enforceable under the FTC rule is because, as was pointed out earlier, uh, the rule uh, applies to um, uh, activities after employment ends. Uh, with a garden leave arrangement, or at least a properly written one, uh, you would, your, your employment would not have ended. Uh, your employment would continue for some period of time after active employment uh, ceases, uh, and therefore I think you could make a pretty good argument that a garden leave arrangement uh, is not banned by the rule. Now, that doesn't mean uh, you, know, you could pay somebody uh, minimum wage uh, during the garden leave period and say, oh, well, they're still employed. I think there's some limits on uh, uh, what would be reasonable compensation under garden leave arrangement, but I do think that's a viable option. couple of other questions as well. Um, one of the other questions that arose is in connection with nonprofit subsidiaries. Uh, one of the questions was, if you have a nonprofit entity that has for-profit subsidiaries, is the for-profit subsidiary still subject to the law? And the likelihood in, in that instance is it is going to be subject to the sort of rule. We do believe that that's a scenario in which the FTC would, would view the entity as qualifying within its purview and therefore qualifying for the law. So that's something to really be on the lookout for with respect to for-profit and non-profit relationships. But Tim, I'll turn it back over to you to ask any other questions. Thanks, Kayla. And I think you know, to, to your point on that for-profit subsidiary type concept at a or a for-profit joint venture of a hospital system, you know, certainly the FTC is signaling just because you're a you know, tax-exempt entity doesn't mean we're not going to think about you. And certainly if you have for-profit subsidiaries, I think that's a situation where it's probably on the definite side. Um, please use our Q&A box if you have any others. Um, while we see if any other questions come in, I'll just say a reminder. We are going to try to apply for CLE credits, as was mentioned a couple times. Um, this is out of an abundance of caution. We gave two CLE codes during this presentation. The first one was healthcare, all one word. The second was FTC. Our staff in follow-up communications thanking you for joining today um, will give instructions on how to actually submit those codes if indeed that is correct process for your state and for the application process. Um, but 
please write it down in case that's the case. And again, it's healthcare first code, FTC the second code. Just waiting to see if there's anything else that comes into the box. Otherwise, I think we got to any everything to our fabulous colleagues of mine that presented today. Um, thank you for letting me MC. But second, anything you think we missed today, Kristen, Mike, um, Kayla, Danny, anything that you want to raise? Tim, the only thing that I would raise is I know many of the people on the phone are extremely familiar with McGuire Woods. You're either a current client or you've been to our conferences and thought leadership. But I put in two kind of plugs and two things so that you all are aware. We do have a, a whole group of attorneys in different sub areas like labor and employment. You just met Mike, uh, tax, employee benefits, obviously regulatory issues. Uh, if you are operating in the health care space and you have a need, please never hesitate to reach out, whether it's about these non-compete issues or otherwise. The other thing is we do have a couple of major conferences coming up that I wanted to let everybody know is going on in September. Our Healthcare Finance and Growth Conference is September 25th and 26th in Charlotte, North Carolina. We hope you are able to join us. We would love to have you. Also, our 2024 Independent Sponsor Conference is in Dallas on October 15th and 16th. Would love to have you there as well. And then we have a series of pop-up events that are happening across the country uh, with respect to healthcare private equity issues. If you are in the healthcare private equity space, uh, please feel free to send any of us an email if you'd like to be involved in those, and we would be happy to add you to the list. I think the next one is going to be New York in New York this summer. Great. Thanks, Kayla. Mike, anything, any last parting thoughts? Uh, no, I think, though, so, you know, that uh, just to maybe mention this again, um, you know, circle back at the end of July. Uh, you know, some things uh, may have changed in terms of how we would advise you or, or you know, someone else might advise you uh, to proceed. So we're still, you know, uh, kind of a work in progress here as to how this um, rule is going to play out. And obviously, uh, the election in November is going to have uh, a, a major effect on it as well. So, uh, you know, we may be uh, in a scenario where uh, there's a lot of flux between now and, you know, frankly, maybe even early next year. So just just stay tuned. Great. Thank, thank you again so much uh, to all our panelists for joining. Um, for all of you that attended, feel free to reach out if there are follow-up questions. Um, and, and again, um, my contact information is being displayed on the screen, but you can reach me at tfry at mcguirewoods.com or on LinkedIn, and I'd be happy to connect you with our panelists. With that, I'm going to ask our ON24 staff um, to close out and um, we will hopefully uh, talk with you all soon.